hi everybody. I am Chris Collier. I'm the Great Lakes Stream Restoration Manager for Trout Unlimited in Northern Wisconsin, which is a fancy way of saying I'm their project manager in Northern Wisconsin. Um, thanks for joining for this presentation today and thanks for Wisconsin Water Week for, for allowing us to give this presentation. So today I'm gonna focus my talk on road stream crossings and the connection with flood resiliency and fish passage. So kind of an overview of what we'll be covering today is just a, an overview introduction to road stream crossings and their connections to floods and fish. And we're gonna to touch on indicators of problems and why inventories are important for road stream crossing projects. We're gonna talk about what's involved in designing better crossings, then dive into partnerships and fundings and talk about some events and trainings that we've developed in the state of Wisconsin for our road stream crossing projects. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of information covered today. Um, and it's gonna be gone through pretty quickly, but what I'm hoping to really leave you with is, is two important take home notes, is that being as proactive as possible when planning and uh, prioritizing with road stream crossing projects is the most important part of this. It helps get ahead of problems and really mitigate the chances of, of catastrophic events we see with road failures. Um, and the other, the other thing I wanna leave you with is that there's lots of partners across the state working on this. And while we do our best to communicate what we're doing and how we can help, uh, it can be lost in all the noise out there. So just never be afraid to reach out to partners and ask questions. Um, you might be surprised what's out there for assistance and who might say, oh, I'm also looking at that project. I can help with something there. Um, so never be afraid to reach out and ask questions. So first an overview. Um, why do we talk about road stream crossings and fish passage? Especially when you talk about the poster child of fish passage, we often think of dams. They're typically larger, they're more apparent. And it's very obvious that they stop flows and create issues for, for fish moving upstream to important uh, spawning habitat in the cases of like trout and salmon. Well, while dams are this poster child, there's relatively few of them across the landscape when you talk about the amount of human infrastructure built around our streams. And what's much more commonplace are road stream crossings. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands across even just the Great Lakes watersheds in Northern Wisconsin. And these can vary from having little to no impact on um, the ecological function of streams to severely impacting it. This photo on the right here is a, pro is a project we're working on in the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest where we have a very healthy brook trout stream, but the trout and other aquatic organisms in that stream cannot get past this culvert. So several miles of streams that in includes important uh, cold water habitat and spawning habitat are inaccessible to these, these trout populations. So while road stream crossings are a lot lower profile and a lot smaller, um, you know, even though you know, it, it results in these undersized crossings, which often create barriers to fish passage, uh, create an oversized impact. And it's not just our flagship species that Trout Unlimited focuses on being salmon and trout. You know, of the 115 species in Wisconsin, the majority of them move at some point in their life history, whether that's for spawning, uh, or accessing you know, thermal refuge like trout will do in the summer to just moving around on a daily basis for foraging. And then you can even dive into species. It goes beyond the fish. I've been saying fish passage, but if we want to get even more specific, it's aquatic organism passage. It's the entire stream system from freshwater mussels that actually shoot out um, their, their larvae into fish. So they require fish to be able to move to establish their populations elsewhere. Um, to semi-aquatic organisms like salamanders and turtles and frogs um, to, you know, otters and mink. And in some cases, we even see deer and other largely terrestrial animals using crossings to avoid roads. You know, roads are easy to travel, but they present a lot of dan danger. And having properly sized crossings, we actually see is uh, encouraging um, these organisms to avoid the, the high mortality risk of roads. And it's not just the organisms. Uh, stream habitat also benefits greatly from these road stream crossing projects. And that's often because we see a lot of pollution with undersized crossings. And while this looks like a relatively healthy, healthy stream here in the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest, if we look a little closer, you can see this actually isn't a stream bank here. When we were on site and did our investigation, this is actually all road gravel that's been annually graded, graded onto the road to offset flooding damage. And where does that flood damage go? Well, it goes into the stream and is actually cutting this, this river off from its floodplain. 
And then if we look even closer, those are road gravel islands, so even more deposition of road material in the stream that's polluting habitat and you know, causing degradation of aquatic habitat. And then it's not just the stream, and even further, it's not just the ecology of the system. Undersized road stream crossings have an oversized impact on our communities. We've seen this more and more recently, especially in the northwest part of the state following the 2016 and 2018 floods, and then the floods we see across the driftless area as well where our infrastructure isn't properly designed to deal with the changing conditions we're facing due to climate change, largely revolving around increasing precipitation amounts that results in increasing flood levels. This results in some cases where roads are just overtopped, but it makes them unsafe. Um, so the floodwaters go over the road because they can't fit through the culvert. Um, to the more extreme examples here, where we see a culvert that is completely washed out and the road is gone. And then the one on the right shows a crushed culvert that shows that even at a you know, typical stream flow level now, this culvert cannot uh, operate in a safe manner. So it's really a, a scenario where we need to rethink culvert management for fish health, for aquatic habitat health, and for the safety of our communities. So I want to dive into some indicators of problems in inventory and, and why we do inventories. We've touched on this a little bit with problems, but I want to give you a couple examples of what we do. So I want to start with common indicators, and this is, you know, what we typically call our partners, something you can see with a windshield survey. So you don't need to even get out of your car in most cases, see these and say, there might be a problem here. And the first is this photo on is showing cracked and rusted culverts. And this is showing something's wrong here, that these culverts are deteriorating quickly. They aren't performing well. This can be as simple as, well, these culverts have been in the ground for 75 years. Maybe they're reaching the end of their life. But a lot of cases, these culverts are probably less than 20 years old and something was wrong in their design that has accelerated how long they, um, or how quickly they've deteriorated in the system. Next, talking about a fish passage concern that's easy to find is perched culverts like this, where you see a, basically a waterfall effect at the outlet where water's coming out. Um, and in this case as well, which is hard to see in a still photo, but the water's coming out at extremely high velocities. So both the fact that aquatic organisms need to jump in, into this culvert, they then need to swim through high velocities that are not um, in reference to the rest of the system. So it just creates an artificial effect that keeps aquatic organisms from moving upstream. Now I wanna talk about some flood concern um, uh, indicators we see. In this case, you see multiple culverts here. And a lot of times we see you know, these one, two, or three extra culverts put in because they're having some flood concerns. And they want to increase their capacity to put flow through that crossing. And this does that, but the problem is it also creates a lot of areas. You can see uh, between each pipe, there's this you know, concrete wall, and that creates an area where the down tree can clog up a pipe or beaver activity can create massive problems with clogged pipes. So while in the short term it can increase flow, there's an increased risk for flood damage due to debris log up, um, debris buildup and clogging pipes. And then looking upstream, we can see this nice pond area right here. The problem is it's not supposed to be a pond. And if you look at the upper, upper part of the photo, you can actually see what looks like, yeah, there's probably a stream channel there, but the pipe is so small, it's actually acting as somewhat like a dam and is blocking water up. So even at base flows, um, when this culvert should be passing water, no problem. It can't. It's actually building it up backwards. So where does the water go during a flood? The wetlands are already filled. Well, the answer is the water is going to go over the road and create some of those problems where we see failures. And then we've already looked at this photo once, and it's just another common indicator of issues at a site is just road material in the road. So or in the stream. So you know we saw the bank here, and then there's also those road gravel islands in the middle. So just seeing stuff like that, these are common indicators that say. There might be something wrong here. We should look at it to see if we have an emerging problem. So if we can complete these windshield surveys so quickly and get a really good idea of why there's a problem there, why do we need to do anything more? Why is there a more rigorous inventory process that we'd complete beyond this? Well, the answer is there's a lot of hidden problems. And in a lot of cases, culverts don't exhibit uh, these indicators I showed in the past few slides so graphically, like so obvious that there's a problem there. A lot of times it can be a little more hidden where it might just be, you know, two larger pipes there, like the photo on the right, uh, that they look fine. Um, they look like they're performing fine. So maybe there's a flood risk there, but there's not severe ponding and velocities aren't coming through really fast and they're not perched. So maybe not a big issue there. Or the photo on the left, the issue we found with this pipe was in the middle of the pipe. 
you can't see that without getting in the stream and looking. So inventories allow us to collect more data on these crossings and go beyond what might be obvious features and really show uh, show us where the problems exist, what's going on, and really help us get an idea of what's happening in the landscape. And then I kind of want to talk about the, the road stream crossing inventories we do. It uses a method called the Great Lakes Road Stream Crossing Inventory Method. And first disclaimer I want to give is this, this method is not exclusive to the, the Great Lakes region. This can be used across Wisconsin, across the upper Midwest, and is honestly applicable to a lot of regions in the East Un United States. It's just called the Great Lakes Road Stream Crossing Inventory because it was made by a number of partners in the Great Lakes Basin, being the Wisconsin DNR, Michigan DNR, Trout Unlimited, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and many others involved in the process. And this used to be a form we took out on a piece of paper and checked off a bunch of boxes and took a few readings and then had to process those papers when we got, got back to the office. Well, we just updated this in 2020, and now we've got a fully electronic version that uses uh, an app on your phone or tablet called Survey123. And this is a GIS app that loads a survey for you to just enter data real easily onto a phone or tablet just using the GPS signal. So you don't even need an active phone signal. And then when you get to internet, you can upload it. So there's no processing forms. There's no dropping forms in the stream on accident, which I've been guilty of many a times. Uh, it really just makes it a cleaner process. And then with a click of a button, it's uploaded to a site that the Michigan DNR has been gracious enough to host. And you can see here what that site shows. It shows us every crossing that we've inventoried in the past year and it'll continue to build on that. So we have a database that anybody can access. So if you have a culvert, you're interested in your communities, you can access this website. It's publicly available and see, has it been inventoried? And if not, well, you can see about inventorying yourself or getting a group like Trout Unlimited to help with that. And diving a little deeper into this website, it allows us to, to check some, some data in more detail. So we can just go from that map that you still see on the right side of this photo but open up a whole bunch of information that then we can, we can sort culverts based on, is it a flood risk? Is it an aquatic organism passage barrier? Um, where is it located? Like by even down to a level of county, what watershed it's in. Um, sorting them by data, like what's the expected climate resiliency of that stream? So you can say, I only want to look at fish barriers on streams that are expected to, you know, host brook trout populations into the late, you know, 2000s. So we're talking like 2080. So it gives a lot of data to play with, and it's pretty technical, but it just provides a nice tool that then we can we can drill down and just see what's going on at crossings and have an idea of where we should focus efforts. So getting away from the desktop here, what's involved in the field with these? Well, first off, you get in the field and you collect some background data on the road, stuff like road name, stream name, size of the road. Um, it collects a GPS point on the tablet here. Here you can see two of my interns from last year working with Florence County in Northeast Wisconsin, teaching them how to use this new survey or this new inventory method. Then you get in the stream and take some measurements of the structure itself. And this gives us some data of structure size. Is there a perch height? What are velocities? And are there any signs of erosion on the road or around the, the culvert? And then we go to a reference reach or a section of the stream that is out of the impact of the crossing. And that allows us to then see what does this stream want to do? What does it look like when you get away from these man-made structures and that then can compare the data from the culvert to the data um, in the stream and say, okay, what are the influences here and how's it changing? And that then gives us a score on what our flood risks are and what the fish passage risks are. And then that gives us an idea of like, is this crossing a barrier? Is it a high flood risk? Is it both? Um, so, you know, these, these crossings can take when you get started up to an hour to run this inventory. It is pretty detailed, although I will say it is user-friendly. And once you complete it a few times, we've had teams that go through and it's about a half an hour per crossing. So it's something that collects a good amount of data and it's not too hard to use and really gives us a clear picture of what's going on on the landscape. So now let's talk about designing better crossings. You know, we've spent our time about what makes a bad crossing, how to identify it and how do we get, you know, a picture of where they are and where we should invest money. But what does investing that money look like? Well, to keep it pretty simple, we want to create a structure that mimics the stream. You know, there's always going to be some sort of impact from putting a man-made structure over top of a stream, but we want it to we want to mitigate that. We want it to be able to accept higher flows. We want the stream to be able to rise and fall while it's in there, and have a deep enough channel during low water, 
but not get to the point where just even the slightest flood, you know, creates a, a situation where we're seeing a lot of erosion, structures getting damaged, or the road overtopping and the, the crossing possibly failing. So typically we do this by creating a structure that is sized to the bankful width of the stream. And talking bankful width, this slide is a little messy here and hard to read. I only want you to focus on the red line. And that red line is kind of showing us what a bankful width is. And in technical terms, this is the recurrence uh, interval for a one or two year flood event. Um, that is what is typically the, the bank forming flow. So it, recur, it, it's, it recurs frequently enough that it creates vegetation like trees and, and a lot of um, longer growing vegetation from form. And you might get some mosses and, and some fast growing stuff, but a lot of times it's the pretty, it's a pretty regular flow that keeps the vegetation scoured away. And when you get into the field, this is what you'd see if you think, you know, what's a river bank, you'd point at it. And that's typically right around your bank full with this. So the big point of this red line is on the far right. It kind of hits the top of that bank where you see it kind of round off. That rounding off is where you get the transition zone from your stream channel to your floodplain. So that curve is our bank full width. And that's what we want to design a structure to. And we find when we design structures to this, we get passage of at least the 100 year flood event. So it's a pretty, pretty impressive uh, benefit by going just to that bankful width where we can fit in a hundred year flow at the very least through these structures. So then what's the next step in designing? How do we design these? Well, the first thing is once we've had our inventory completed and found you know, a problem structure, we wanna go in and shoot a survey. And this involves taking a total station like you'll see engineers uh, and construction firms using to um, shoot project sites or design where roads are gonna go, where roads are gonna be expanded. And we shoot a, a survey of the stream. So we go through and collect elevation data of where the, the water surface is, where the stream bottom is, where the road is overlaid, where the structures are, how deep the structures are embedded. And then we use this to, to pull the stream from the physical environment to a computer environment that we can then place new structures in and see how would this fit? How would this look? And then we can run analyses to see how is this gonna respond to certain flood flows. And then in some cases, this photo on the right is showing a team of interns we had out actually collecting data on what the stream bed materials were. Uh, some cases in Wisconsin, our streams don't need to have a stream bed built because we have sand systems and areas that are just going to put that stream bed in for us. But in a stream like this one on the right, it was a rocky bottom and we wanted to collect data so we could build that stream bed structure in the new culvert, mimicking the stream. We want it to mimic. And with structure like that, it's not going to move it on its own. So as part of the design, we actually collected that data and then made a stream simulation where we were able to build that into the pipe and have that stream habitat with those larger rocks and boulders continue through the culvert. So I wanna take a quick look, kind of diving into this process and what data or information we collect and show. Um, first things first is we take our identified problem crossing. This is in Ocano County, uh, it's McDonald Creek, and it's something we identified with our partners at the US Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and Wisconsin DNR. And we found a culvert that was undersized and it was set too high. So it was actually damming water on the upstream. You can see the bottom of the culvert down here on the left because uh, it's set above the stream bed. And then on the outlet, you can see it's actually perched. And there was about a five and a half foot deep plunge pool there uh, that was a little dicey to wade through. Um, so when we shoot our survey, we then put it into an Excel file and can create something like this. And this is called a longitudinal profile, which is what it is. It's a profile look at the stream. It shows us what's going on um, on the stream bed. And this, this line is a photo or a, a plot of the stream bed. So upstream is on the right and downstream is on the left. So starting at the right, we can see as we start flowing down, we then hit, you know, we go through our typical channel where we have some riffles and pools, pools being these deeper pockets where you see kind of a sharp drop then rise typical habitat in a stream. Then we hit this here and that linear drop is the culvert. And you can see how you've got this line that just shoots straight up. And that's showing that the culvert is set too high. It, this is an unnatural shoot. And you can just see how high that goes up based on where the stream bed is. And then when it comes out, you can see something again. And that's the plunge pool I was talking about. We get this huge cascade down of water and it's just even with a slower flowing stream, you can see it just scour away the stream bed and habitat and really start um, 
just kind of chewing away at everything and really um, creating some issues at the site. Another thing I wanted to point out was this little rise here. Um, it looks like it's part of kind of a pool system, but in actuality with our field assessment, we were able to figure out that was actually a large amount of sediment that was building up this, this kind of slug of sediment like you associate with dams when they're concerned about sediment after dam removals. Well, it's because this culvert was set so high, it created a dam effect and was inhibiting uh, sediment transport that naturally occurs in a stream. So by looking at a replacement here, we're also focusing on, you know, fixing that sediment transport, another part of, you know, restoring habitat. So it's kind of cool when you get these, you get, you get a visualization of problems you start to identify through the inventory and you can really get a look at, okay, what does this look like in the stream? Another thing we get when shooting these surveys are cross sections. And these are what we use to show what does the channel look like and how is it impacted by the culvert? So instead of just looking at a profile, we can look at how does this look in a cross section view? And then we can use this to model how flows will respond. So the cross section on the left here labeled XS1 is an area in the reference reach. So it gives us an idea of what the channel looks like out of the impact of the culvert and this bluish blackish line going through the middle of that is just the marked estimate of where that bank full bank forming flow is. So that's about the, the flow level that is going to be designed or um, creating the channel we see during regular flow events. Well, then looking at the, the cross section on the right labeled XS2, we see a much different picture here. And that's right at that plunge pool. We can see a very steep channel bank and it doesn't have these kind of, um, more gradual lines coming off the left and right above that bank full line like the left one does. Uh, and that's showing how the channel has just been severely modified by these flows um, created by the culvert. Well, then we can take all this data and create plan sheets. And this is what we use when doing construction. It also helps us visualize what does restoration at the site look like? And then once we have these finished and agreed upon with the partners, we can hand it to a construction firm and they can use this to then put in that new pipe. So just kind of calling out the important stuff from here I want to show is, first thing is on this McDonald Creek crossing, what we found was the way the stream came in, it took two 90 degree turns. It hit a ditch, went into the ditch, and then took a 90 degree turn again through the old structure. Well, as part of the restoration, we wanted to realign the stream to be more natural flow and take away those turns, which create erosion and flood risks. So we can show where the new structure is on this photo, you know, shown by these red lines on the left versus the old structure. And then we kind of repair this plunge pool that's created and get a more naturally functioning stream. And then McDonald Creek is an ongoing project. So I don't have the after photos to show yet, but I want to show photos from a very similar project we completed in the past couple of years. It's going to show what this is going to look like in the end. This is Colburn Creek in the Schwamigan Nicolay, and it was a similar instance where we had undersized pipes, perched outlets, high velocities, and kind of a damming effect from culverts set too high. The photo on the left is the before photos, and you can actually see what I was talking about with multiple pipes and wood getting hung up. Now, fortunately, this is a small piece of wood. It's not going to plug a pipe, but you get one of those hung up. Well, then one gets caught on that, and then another, and you start building a dam. Well, then we get this new structure on the right. It's single span. So there's not that area between pipes for things to get hung up on and it's designed to bank full width. So the stream is going to move wood that is less than bank full width. So if we design a structure to bank full width, it's gonna push it through. We also had lower velocities. We had habitat that we were able to restore in the pipe and we restored that sediment transport. So there wasn't a buildup of sediment upstream anymore. So this is what McDonald Creek will look like when completed. So now I want to get to that second key point I was talking about, and that's partnerships. And a part, a part of the partnerships discussion is also talking about funding. So the big thing is what can partners do for you? What can they help you with? Um, the first thing I want to talk about is regional trainings. This is something TU and our partners with the Forest Service, with Wisconsin DNR, and so many others have helped with. Um, you know, we do these trainings doing road stream crossing tours, which you can see an example of on the left. And this event is we just take people, we get a bus and we drive around to several examples of bad crossings. And then we look at several examples of crossings that have been replaced in ways to fix those problems. Um, it gives kind of a crash course for what these projects look like and, and what's involved in replacing them. So we can point out all those windshield survey problems and say, well, that's a problem. Well, this is a problem. And then a road manager or a town chairperson is gonna say, well, how do I fix that problem? This is what the tour is for. We wanna say, 
this is where we see common issues and this is what we use to solve it and it's been good for x y and z then we offer a, a two-day workshop um you can see the the in-class portion on the right here uh, but it's it's an in-class kind of lecture series plus field experience where we talk about design methods, what's involved in inventories, how we go about doing surveys, and then what partners and funding are available to help me if I don't have the capacity to, let's say, write grants or something. Uh, and, and, and that's how we're able to kind of get beyond just identifying problems and talk about, okay, how do we start this process? Next thing we can help, I'm going to dive into more like on the ground, how can partners help? Um, and I will say a, a, a disclaimer here is a lot of these are modeled after what TU does to help our partners. But there's a lot of partners out there that do similar, possibly even more or different parts of these processes. So it's not just something Trout Unlimited does or lots of organizations that help with this, both, you know, state, federal government and nonprofit, private and other. Um, so inventories and prioritization. A lot of times, you know, maybe you don't have the time to learn how to do this or you don't have the, uh, the volunteer power or the staff power to go out and get a lot of inventories done. Well, that's for TU and I mentioned our inventories teams working with Florence County. And we also have all of our members that serve as volunteers too, can go out and do these surveys on certain streams or these inventories to collect that data. You need to see where are my problem crossings? And then we can sit down and help go through that. I showed you the really nice to use DNR website and it is really nice and it's publicly accessible, but sometimes it's still a matter of time. And, and can somebody help me, you know, take this data and say, okay, there's problems here. Which one should I focus on? That's where we can help sit down and walk through why a certain project or a certain set of projects might be more of a priority than others. And survey and design. This is where we get really technically heavy, where if you don't have engineering staff or the budget to pay for a consulting firm to do this, it can be really difficult. And what we like to put a plug in here for TU is, is we're cheap. A lot of times we have funding to do some of this work or require significantly less than a consulting firm would. Um, but partners can do this, and there's also agency partners that can shoot uh, surveys from Wisconsin DACTAP to, to Wisconsin DNR to, to others. So it's just reach out and ask who can help. And like I said, a lot of times TU has money in place to help with this process, or we can go out and shoot a survey. And at the very case, like I'm talking about the McDonald Creek, we created the 30% preliminary design to get a picture of what the project would look like and how much it would cost. And that then allows them to apply for funding uh, to finish that design work and look for implementation. So talking about funding, grant writing administration and project cost share. This is a lot of difficult stuff to manage in projects, especially when you start talking big money projects, like if you have to put a bridge in or a very large structure, costs can get up pretty quickly and you need to start looking at potentially federal funding to couple with maybe some local municipal or state funding. Well, those speaking from experience, those federal, those federal grants, while awesome, can sometimes be difficult to manage. And having a group like TU, or other um, watershed groups, natural resource conservation groups, really have developed expertise at managing these and even identifying which ones are out there. There's so many funding opportunities. It can be hard to know what will fund what and what's even out there and reaching out just for help and writing, just, just writing the grant. Maybe you need help writing the grant and administrating the grant because you just, the reporting process and all that stuff is difficult. Um, it's where we can really plug in and help and help with that process, either as a lead or as just assistance in helping to build capacity. And then sometimes groups will have funding for certain watersheds. Like in some cases, TU will have money built up to where somebody comes with a project. It's like, actually, that's a shared priority. We might have, you know, a few thousand dollars here we can help fund a project with, and that can help unlock even more resources. Uh, so lots of stuff here where I really wanted to hammer home that point of reach out to your partners. Don't be afraid to ask questions because at the very least, you're going to get some advice or you might have somebody say, well, that's not something we'd work on, but so-and-so at this organization is going to be really interested in hearing about that. Next step is contracting and construction management. Once we have, you know, all the funding in place, we need to build the structure. So, you know, groups can help with doing that bidding process if you don't have, you know, an in-house construction road crew. Uh, so bidding out and then overseeing that construction can be another way that, that help you know, partners can help implement a project. And then a lot of times when you use funding from a federal agency, there's some sort of monitoring required to show we accomplish the goals we hope to. That can be shooting a, a survey afterwards to show how the stream has changed and show how velocities have improved to improve fish passage, that's the case, or to improve um, flood resiliency at a structure. And that's another area where if you've got some monitoring requirements at a site, you know, even if TU hasn't been involved at the project at all, if 
you know, there could be a chance that we could help with some of that monitoring. And we helped the Wisconsin DNR on a project shoot a, shoot a survey this year on one that, that they really led and took charge of, but we were able to come in and help with that monitoring component of it. And then last thing on partners, who are they? There's so many out there, there's no way I could do it justice and list them all. So I wanted to kind of do a grab bag here of ones Trout Unlimited works with extensively. Some federal agencies like the US Forest Service, US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and FEMA come to mind as ones that prioritize road stream crossings for a variety of reasons, be it flood resiliency, uh, infrastructure security, so we have you know safe roads to be on, or fish passage and aquatic habitat. Then there's our state agencies like Wisconsin DNR, the Department of Agricultural Trade and Consumer Protection, Wisconsin Emergency Management, and the State Department of Transportation all have some stake in this and are all you know open to conversations or exploring problems. Um, and then there's your nonprofits like Trout Unlimited, like the Wisconsin Wetlands Association, Wisconsin Land and Water, and so many other local watershed groups or land trusts and stuff like that, that really have a passion for this work and are out there to help. And like I said, the big take home here is there's no way I could list all the partners, reach out to those in the area that you think would care about this and just talk about the project. And in the worst case, they're likely going to point you to somebody that might be more appropriate to help with it. One plug I wanted to give, we do have upcoming events, you know, with the, the recent good news with, with the COVID vaccines, we're hopeful to be returning to in-person activities and meetings here, you know, by late summer. So in line with that, we're planning to host our next road stream crossing project tour. So looking at some sites on a one day bus tour in either mid to late summer or fall of this year, it's going to be located in the Hayward area. We're going to hit several sites in that area and have a good day of discussions and, and infield work and hopefully great weather. Then this fall, we're planning our next two day workshop. It's going to be in the Ashland area and that'll be a, a combined um, looking at what is our in-class lectures on designing and what's involved with that and then field work showing you, okay, we talked about this in class, now let's put it into practice. And the last thing, we're developing new events to kind of launch this new road stream crossing inventory. Um, a big component of that is getting people trained up on how to use it because while it is pretty easy to use, if you've never used it before, it's going to be difficult. So that's to be determined at that point. We're hoping that by next year, we're hosting a series of rotating trainings. But if you're with a group or, or have a group of people that'd be interested, reach out. Uh, my contact information is right here. Feel free to reach out and, and let us know if you'd like to get some training and we can look at doing something. So with that, um, that's all the information I had today. I know it was a lot, so I'm happy to entertain questions and, and continue discussions. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, we did have quite a few questions and we've got a few minutes here left. Um, and folks, if you, you can upvote other questions and move them to the top, some people have picked up on that. So I'll start with the most popular here. Aren't there benefits to culverts that are many waterfalls, oxygenation, scour holes might provide habitat, et cetera, and an easy fishing spot for young anglers and elderly anglers. So the scour, the scour pools do create pretty easy fishing spots and that may seem like a good habitat spot, but the more reason the fish are staging there is yes, it gives a deep pool, which is typically a good refuge, but they're staging there because they're trying to move upstream and they're stuck there. Um, you'll actually, I, I have experience working on a project site in a past life in Ohio where they actually outlawed um, fishing in certain proximities to dams because they created similar environments. So while they hold fish, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and in terms of oxygenation, you know that it is important to have highly oxygenated water, but I'm not aware of anything out there that shows that that's um, resolving any issues resulted with, with um anoxic waters typically in a stream system, as long as it's not being impeded by flow, just the natural flow of that stream is going to do the oxygenation. Great. Second question here, replacing culverts is very expensive and has a lot of red tape. How much cooperation do you get from DOT, DNR and local governments? And I think you did touch on that, but maybe you can expand. Yeah. You know, the DNR has been an excellent partner. Um, they've got their transportation liaison and other staffs that were, are willing, they understand the issue. They're really, really willing and excited to work on it. So they've been no issue whatsoever. And honestly, permitting, knock on wood, has continued to get more and more straightforward as we've worked through it. Uh, there's definitely red tape, but, you know, 
there's been a lot of work with DNR to get on the same page with this. DOT, we're working on that process. They're definitely open to it. And we're just kind of really hitting that, what I, what I was talking about, the importance of planning. You know, we're trying to plan with them so we don't kind of blindside them with projects. And, and if we identify issues on state roads, we can reach out to the state DOT and say, hey, you know, we, we saw a potential project here. Do you have any plans to repave this road or do any work here that we could roll up a culvert product in? And we just did that um, up in the northern part of the state on Highway 70 um, this past year. So had a chance we were able to collaborate that way. So it's definitely getting better or is already in pretty good situations. That's good to hear. Uh, this next question says, does something like this exist in Wisconsin? And I think this came in early when you were talking about the road crossing inventory. Um, it pretty clearly it does, but maybe it's not complete or. Could... Yeah. So that's a big discussion going on is how do we get all this data for the state? That's the, that's the end goal we want to have is we want to get as many crossings and inventory using the same data. And that's where this collaboration with Michigan DNR came in. And like I said, why it's, while it says Great Lakes Road Stream Cross and Inventory, it's not exclusive to that. It's applicable across the strait. And our end goal is as we roll this out over the next couple of years, we want it used across the state because then we'll be working with the same, the very similar data across watersheds and across regions that we can then use to, to prioritize projects on local, regional, and statewide scales. So it doesn't exist yet, but we're trying to get to that point. Great. Uh, any idea on the general cost difference between standard round culverts and going to a single span rectangular culvert? That varies wildly. Um, it is going to be more expensive to go to those um, single span structures. And that's always the big issue we see as we work with people for the first or second time on these projects is the sticker shock at first. What we do have significant evidence of, and there's more research being done on this, so more to come. But what we see is the, the cost savings outweighs it. So long-term, these save money. There's less annual maintenance and the lifespans of these structures uh, tend to last longer. Mentioning those large 2016 and 2018 floods up in the Northwest part of the state, the Forest Service is actually able to go through and look at some of the culverts they had installed using these design methods versus the ones that had used past methods. And on the whole, the ones used to, des to designed using these new methods performed much better and survived the floods while the other ones failed at a more um, at a at a worse level and more frequently, so the long term cost savings really add up. Um, that's and and kind of to touch on you know that doesn't fully make a town want to say well I can then spend you know X amount thousand more to put in this new structure right now if you don't have the budget for it, you don't have the budget for it. That's where the partnerships are a big thing and where we want to really get discussions going on. Let's work together. Um, you don't have to go it alone because you know that does help overcome that that budgeting concern. Just put a pitch in for our river protection grant program as well. We do a lot of this kind of work in the in the grant program. Yes, we've used those extensively, and they're a fantastic tool. Um, are there any workshops planned for the southeast or southern part of the state? Seem to be in the north right now. We're in the north right now. Um, I know my colleague Jeff Hastings in the Driftless, which being the southwest part of the state, um, does similar work, though it's not as road stream crossing based. You know, there's discussions in our group, you know, we did a, we did a present, we did one of these workshops in the Northeast. Now we're doing the Northwest. There's going to be discussions with our partners statewide to see if there's interest in getting this moving around the state. So stay tuned. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of this year, we have an announcement on what's going to come next. And that could mean getting into a more Southern Southeastern part of the state. Great. Um, still got some questions here. How can we predict down cutting to set the culverts low enough? Yeah. Um, so the big thing is you want to get below that stream bed. Um, we typically go a couple feet below. Um, you just want to get beneath that mobile surface. Um, so that's why we shoot those stream profiles so we can see where the bottom is and not just kind of eyeball it. Um, we see a lot of times these culverts are set maybe just a couple inches below or just on top of it thinking like, oh, it's not going to be that bad. It's right there. But getting a couple feet below is typically what you need. Um, the other side of that too is making sure you do bank full width or at least extremely close to it because even if you get below if you've constricted the stream too much it can create some weird hydraulics that end up digging your culvert out um so it's a matter of taking you know great care to get that stream bed profile so you can know where your elevation is but then also making the width of your culvert is is appropriately sized so that you avoid any altered hydraulics that that will change where your stream bed's located great 
This one's a little long. Um, you mentioned reference stream sections for comparison to less desirable crossings. What types of criteria used to determine reference conditions? Are they specific or are used across multiple streams in a given area? So they're typically specific to streams, um, to each individual stream, but they can, um, you can use similar streams in the event that you have a highly modified stream that you need to find something that's similar to it uh, to get that reference reach. Um, I know that'd be, that would be more common in more of an urban place or maybe waterways have been more channelized or heavily impacted by successive road stream crossings where it's just never able to get back to a natural state. So there are cases where you can work with, you know, like a, a DNR biologist or water resource specialist to say, what's a similar stream I can use as a reference um, on streams that do have the space to get back to a natural flow condition, or at least more natural flow condition. I think the rule of thumb is like something like 20 times the width of the culvert is what you determine to how far away you want to get to make sure you're out of the impact area. But it's really just getting out of that area where you see, you know, plunge pools, really high flows, and even road material on the road. So, you know, typically on a lot of smaller streams, if you're hundred feet from the culvert, you're further away. Sometimes you need to go further if it's a, if it's a bigger structure, but it can get pretty apparent where you see these highly modified areas. And typically they are able to be found on each individual stream. Great, uh, a couple more here, we'll wrap up. Are there other restoration or protection mechanisms or projects that you do in conjunction with culvert projects? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, I should have given a shout out when I was listing the partners with the Wisconsin Wetlands Association. Um, you know, why is a wetlands association concerned with culverts? Well, it's because a lot of times our floodplains are heavily impacted. And in cases where we might see a culvert that has, you know, we just talked about head cutting and incision, um, that can result in floodplain wetlands being cut off. So maybe part of that project is also restoring the stream outside of the culvert so that we can restore those wetlands. So yes, we do like to do in areas where we've seen heavy impact to the surrounding um, riparian environment, we will do some restoration activities um, to stabilize banks, restore wetlands, and, and just improve habitat if needed. Great, uh, last question right now. Uh, how does this fit into Fish Works? W-E-R-K-S, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, that's an online resource that has done a great job kind of doing estimated uh, barriers by with culverts um, and, uh, and a slew of other information. Um, but they've, they've helped to do things like estimating where barriers exist. This kind of builds on that, where that's a model that shows where barriers may exist in the landscapes and gives us a great starting point to say, okay, these are identified potential barriers. Let's take a look at them and see if they really are. Well, then we can move out from there and find out what's the surrounding landscape, like where were potential barriers missed? Um, and that's where the inventory is great. So Fishworks gives us a great starting point, and then we can take this and kind of go out from it. So this kind of builds on that modeling work and, and gets it to a let's get in the field data and then determine which of these identified barriers needs to be addressed first. Well, great, that uh, looks like it wraps up our questions. I wanna thank you a lot for your talk today, Chris. Anything else you wanna mention before we sign you off? Uh, I just thank you everybody for, for paying attention and for the great questions. Uh, it's really great to kind of talk about this work. It's it's really a fun thing where a lot of times you don't think about culprits, but as soon as you see it, you can't miss them. Um, so just kind of reiterating the importance of planning and prioritization and give anybody a call. You know, you can give me a call, even if I don't, or if you aren't a Great Lakes watershed where I focus, give me a call and I can say who you should reach out to. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions. Well, thanks. Thanks again. And uh, thanks, Jim Mickler for the presentation earlier and Emily. Um, we're going to take a break here now at 930 for 15 minutes, just real quick. And then the sessions start back up at 845. Any other instructions, Chad? No, I think that's it. Um, thanks again, and yeah, we'll we'll be back uh, for the next section session uh, at eight or at nine forty-five.